Okay, here's the cast of representative heroes and geniuses for today. Romulus is the fellow traditionally given credit for the founding of the city of Rome, and Rome is our main subject today. As Livy, the sort of official Roman historian of Augustus's day, presents the case, Rome expanded by conquering people who attacked it, and one of those was, of course, Hannibal. And we'll hear about how he crossed the Alps and came all the way ad portus Romae to the gates of Rome before finally being defeated himself. Julius Caesar is known as the conqueror of Gaul and is the last ruler of the Roman Republic and of course for his affair with Cleopatra. And the empire began with his adopted heir known as Augustus. We'll hear something about Roman literature in the days of Cicero, Livy, Ovid, Virgil, the so-called golden age of Latin literature. But after Augustus' day, things slide downhill, and Nero is well enough known for his silliness and cruelty. After his death, things will stabilize a bit under the Flavian emperors, Vespasian and Titus, and in their day, the Colosseum was built and Vesuvius erupted, burying Pompeii, which we'll visit and where we'll wind up this series. So after the fall of Troy, Aeneas and a few other Trojan heroes fled west, stopping at Carthage, where he had his affair with Dido that led to her suicide, presaging later trouble between her Carthage and what would be the Rome of his descendants. He landed first at Cumae, where he met the Cumaean Sibyl, who, after he acquired the mysterious golden bough, admitted him to the underworld. There he had experiences which are certainly similar to the ones Dante has in the Divine Comedy, and of course Virgil is his guide. Aeneas and his party then moved on to land on the coast of Latium, followed by more adventures we don't have time for, but his son Ulysses then went up to found the <clears throat> settlement at Alba Longa, southeast of where Rome would one day be. Archaeological evidence has turned up nothing inconsistent with this, which is just an historian's polite way of saying there's essentially nothing to support it either. This is now the most famous thing on the shore of Lake Alba. This is Castle Gandolfo, which is supposed to have been built on the side of the citadel of this original settlement. The papacy has owned this property since 1596, and the popes have often used it as a summer residence. According to the Roman historian Titus Livius, known as Livy, eight generations after Eulus arrived here, his descendant Numitor was overthrown by a usurper named Amulius, who made Numitor's daughter swear to remain a virgin so that the line of Aeneas would die out and his own could take over. Unfortunately for him, a vow to remain a virgin isn't the most reliable form of birth control, and Mars, she claimed, overcame whatever resistance she put up, and the result was the birth of twin sons, named Romulus and Remus. When Amulius found out about these new rivals, he ordered them abandoned on the edge of the swamp, which then occupied the site of the future capital of what those who would live in it would be pleased to call the civilized world. The Forum would then have been essentially underwater and more or less surrounded by the Capitoline, Palatine, and Esquiline hills. Luckily for the boys, they were nursed by a she-wolf until the shepherd Faustulus, who knew their origin, found them and took over their care. In the Capitoline Museum, we can see what is said to be most likely an Etruscan she-wolf in bronze, for which Cellini in the 16th century made two boys on the assumption that it represented the wolf of the story. Depending on the attitude of the museum director in charge, they are sometimes displayed with the wolf, sometimes not. In any case, when the boys were grown, Faustulus told them of their ancestry. They returned to Alba Longa, overthrew Amulius the usurper, and restored Numitor to power. They then returned with a band of hardy followers to establish their own settlement where they had been found by the wolf. The year of their return became the year 1 AUC, Aburbe Condita, from the founding of the city. We call it 753 BC.
There's plenty of evidence that the hills surrounding what became the Forum were inhabited in the 8th century and even before. The so-called House of Romulus, which you see now on the Palatine Hill, is of uncertain date, but it was on this hill that the largest number of inhabitants in the area, circa 700 BC, probably lived. The story goes that since the Romans had come from Alba Longa without any women, they invited the neighboring Sabine tribe, which lived on the Esquiline Hill, to come to a big party. And they were told to be sure and bring their wives. They did, and the Romans ran off with all of them. When the Sabines, once sobered up, returned to fight to get them back, a big battle took place near the Forum, and a Sabine hero named Medius Curtius nearly drowned in a part of the swamp known ever thereafter as Curtius's Lake. There's another Curtius associated with it as well, but we don't have time for all the stories. According to Livy, the girls suddenly ran between the two armies and said something like, Stop, stop, we like the Romans better now anyway. Surprisingly, the Sabines not only agreed to let the Romans keep the women, they agreed to join their people as a whole to the Romans, and thus had the honor to become the first people in history to be absorbed in, into what would become an empire stretching from the British Isles to the Persian Gulf. Incidentally, if you toss a rock into the well-like hole under that tin roof, it'll fall into the water that's still down there. When the forum was excavated in the 19th century, the archaeologists stopped at the level of the place as it stood more or less in Augustus's day, which meant something like 20 feet of rubble had to be taken out. And in many places, you're still walking 20 feet above the swamp that was here 2,500 years ago. Rudolfo Lanciani dug down through 70 feet of occupied levels near the Palatine Hill. The Forum appears to be in a hole today, but that's because it's been dug out and the rest of the city around it hasn't. Unfortunately, Romulus and Remus quarreled over the interpretation of some omens and the former killed the latter. That's why it's called Rome and not Reem, I guess. According to Livy, Romulus was taken off to heaven in a thunderstorm, but there was also a tradition to the effect that his mortal parts were buried here in the Forum. In this picture, you can see the thing called the Black Stone, which is still buried about 20 feet or more down in that place. It's important because it is thought to be inscribed with the earliest surviving example of written Latin. Turned sideways, you may be able to make out the word sacros s, something is sacred, but the meaning of most of the rest is far from clear. This is the copy of the thing on display in the Museo Diocletiano in Rome, with that line indicated. The date for it is thought to be 6th century, which would be too late for it to have any obvious connection to Romulus, who would have died in the 8th century. For a good part of their history, in fact, the Romans wrote almost nothing in Latin or any other language that survives. The 5th century in Athens produced Sophocles, Plato, Thucydides, and pretty much all we have in Latin through that period is this thing. The first work of literature in Latin, which we know of, was significantly a translation of the Odyssey made around 250 BC, but nothing original survives until we get to the comedies of Plautus, who lived from around 284 to 184 BC, and Terence, who lived from about 195 to 159 BC. Then there's nothing more for another hundred years or so, until suddenly the floodgates open to the extent that I think one could maintain that the most important contribution the Romans make to the history of civilization is, in fact, Latin literature. This is an Etruscan helmet, again recalling Greek influence. According to Livy, after the death of Romulus, the Romans adopted a sort of elective monarchy, and it is said that in the 6th century an Etruscan named Lucius Tarquinius Priscus was actually chosen king. But some think that this is just a way of disguising what may have been an actual takeover of the city by the Etruscans. This fellow's son was Tarquinius Superbus, the Proud, but Tarquinius Priscus adopted Servius Tullius as his designated successor in place of his own son, Superbus. This is part of what is called the Servian Wall, said to have been built by Servius Tullius after his accession, but although it is a part of the oldest surviving wall around Rome, it is considered by archaeologists to be only 4th century BC, not 6th century. Amazingly, although the city eventually expanded far beyond this wall, 
It was not completely replaced until the 3rd century AD, which is a tribute to the success of Roman armies which, after Hannibal's invasion, were able to keep foreign armies far from the capital for more or less 500 years. The Servian Wall included all seven hills and ran south from the Capitoline almost as far as the Port of San Paolo and then to the northeast about as far as where the modern train station is and then curved around west of the Quirinal Hill back to the capital. Tarquinius Superbus eventually murdered his father's adopted heir and then the son of Superbus, Sextus Tarquin, committed, thanks to Shakespeare and others, one of the most famous crimes in Roman history, the rape of Lucretia, the rape of Lucrece, who was the wife of the Roman general Collatinus. She committed suicide, and her husband and his friend Lucius Unius Brutus, who was himself related to the Tarquins, led a revolt against them and established the Roman Republic in 509 BC. The Capitoline Museum has this bust, which is at least traditionally identified as a portrait of Brutus, although art historians generally argue it couldn't be that old. This is not, of course, the more famous Marcus Brutus who stabbed Caesar. The executive branch of the Republic was to consist of two consuls, probably on the model of the Spartan Duarchy, which had two kings. The idea was that nothing could be done unless both agreed, but usually, as in the Spartan system, one of the two was much more of a leader and got his way. The Tarquins didn't just give up after this. They pled their case to Lars Porcena, the king of the Etruscan city of Clusium, modern QC in Tuscany, and according to Macaulay, Lars Porcena of Clusium, by the nine gods he swore that the noble house of Tarquin would suffer wrong no more. This thing behind the arch of Septimius Severus in the Forum is sometimes called the Altar of Vulcan, but this is also where a statue of the Roman hero Horatio once stood. It is said that when Lars Porcena and the Tarquins attacked Rome across the Pons Sublicius that spanned the river, Horatio led the resistance, and finally holding them off single-handedly, he ordered the bridge cut down behind him, and then jumped in the river as it fell and swam to safety. This was such a noble thing, says Macaulay, that the Etruscans themselves could scarce forbear to cheer. Livy, who was writing his history in Augustus' day, is sometimes said to have been influenced by the emperor to give a lot of attention to stories like this in hopes of inspiring the Romans, whom Augustus thought were going soft in his day, to be more inclined to self-sacrifice and discipline. It's Livy who tells us how Torquatus killed his own son who won a battle but disobeyed orders, and how Cincinnatus, the quintessential citizen soldier, just put down his plow in the field to serve his country, after which he simply went back and picked up where he'd left off with the plow. As Livy saw it, Rome expanded by conquering people who attacked it. Rome followed the he-hit-me-first theory of foreign policy, a not uncommon excuse for imperialism. In 410, the Romans under Camillus conquered the Etruscan capital at Veii, but in 390, Brennus and the Gauls swarmed through the pass in the Alps named after him and occupied Rome itself, with, according to tradition, the exception of the Capitoline Hill. Camillus, however, was able to drive them back north, and in doing so, he expanded Roman hegemony all the way to the Po River. In 295, the Romans defeated the Samnites at Sentinum, and that brought all Italy essentially under their control, except for the Greek city-states around the foot of the Italian boot. The Greeks then hired the highly regarded adventurer, Pyrrhus, the king of Epirus, to defend them, and this is a portrait of him by an unknown artist. Pyrrhus did defeat the Romans at Heraclea in 280, but after the victory he made a comment more famous than the battle. Another victory like that and I'll be ruined. And a Pyrrhic victory is still one which is almost as bad as a defeat. He won a similarly costly battle at Ascoli the next year, but finally at Benevento in 275 the Romans did defeat him and became the rulers of all Italy. This, however, brought them into friction with the Carthaginians, who were established in Sicily, just a few miles across the Strait of Messina. This is the site of
outside of ancient Carthage now, essentially where modern Tunis is. Uh, according to tradition, the city had been established by Queen Dido, daughter of the king of Tyre, and the Romans traced the source of the enmity between themselves and Carthage back to the anger of Dido, who committed suicide after being deserted by Aeneas, who was obliged to sail on to found Roman civilization. In any case, by the 3rd century BC, Carthage was the preeminent naval power in the Mediterranean, and its merchants and explorers had sailed as far as Britain and over 2,000 miles down the Atlantic coast of Africa. Rome, on the other hand, had no real fleet at all. The conflict between them is superficially reminiscent of that between the sea power of Athens and the army of Sparta, and in both cases it was the state with the army that eventually won. In this picture, you're looking from Messina on Sicily toward the mainland. At its narrowest point, the strait is less than five miles wide, but to the landlubber Romans, it must have seemed like the Pacific. In 264, however, a group of Italian mercenaries seized control of Messina and asked Rome for help against the Carthaginians. The Romans managed to float an army across under the color cover of darkness, took possession of the city, and thereby began what is called the First Punic War. The Latin word poeni, from which the word Phoenician comes, is derived from a Greek root meaning reddish. The thought is that this might refer to the famous Tyrian purple dye, or else to the darker skin of the Phoenicians themselves, and likewise then to their Carthaginian relatives. Among the many impressive ruins on Sicily, some of which we've seen in past classes, is the 600-foot-long foundation of the so-called Altar of Zeus, built by Hero II, the Greek ruler of Syracuse, who had once been a general in the army of Pyrrhus. At first allied with Carthage, he went over to the Romans, who then left him in temporary control of the southeastern part of the island after the Carthaginian evacuation. He was a relative and sponsor of Archimedes, one of the greatest minds of the ancient world, who after the death of Hero was killed in the later Roman attack on Syracuse following his legendary attempt to set the Roman ships on fire using giant mirrors. After three years of the First Punic War, the Romans had occupied all of Sicily, but without a strong fleet, they knew it would be difficult to maintain themselves there surrounded by the hostile Carthaginian navy. The earliest surviving historical treatment of early Rome is that of the Greek Polybius, who was born about 200 BC and lived much of his life in Rome, where he could talk to many who were eyewitnesses to the events he covers, essentially the period of the Punic Wars from the mid-3rd century to the mid-2nd century. As he tells the story more or less, the Romans used a captured Carthaginian ship as a model from which to construct better ones of their own. However, the Romans added a device called a raven, which was a kind of hinged gangplank with a spike in the end of it, which could be dropped down onto the deck of an enemy ship, attaching the two together. Roman infantry would then cross over and attack the sailors, who would not be prepared for that kind of combat. Here in 260 at Punamalazzo on the northeast coast of Sicily, the Roman fleet and its ravens got its first big test, and against all knowledgeable speculation, soundly defeated the favored Carthaginians. The beaks of some of the captured Carthaginian ships were displayed on the speaker's platform in Rome, in keeping with the precedent actually set after an earlier capture of some ships and that platform still survives in a later incarnation, and you can see where the by then symbolic ship's beaks were attached to the front of it. Since the Latin word for beak is rostrum, the platform itself came to be known as the rostrum, and of course we still use that word today to designate a speaker's platform. Once the Romans had developed a fleet, they thought the hard part of the war with Carthage was over because they were very confident about the ability of their army on land.
In 256, the Roman commander Regulus defeated another Carthaginian fleet off the south coast of Sicily at Cape Ecnomus in one of the largest naval battles in ancient history. And then a Roman army under his leadership was landed on the coast of what's now Tunisia, southeast of Carthage. Just as the Carthaginian navy was thought a sure thing at the Battle of Punamalazzo, now everyone thought that the Roman army was a sure thing on dry land in Africa. The Carthaginians, however, had hired a Spartan military advisor, and whether his work was responsible for what happened isn't certain, but the Carthaginians beat the Romans. At the Battle of the Bagratus River, and according to tradition, Regulus himself was captured and sent back to Rome to negotiate a treaty favorable to Carthage, or else he promised he would come back to Africa and allow himself to be tortured to death. When he got to Rome, however, he told the Senate to make no treaty whatever with Carthage. Considering that, one would certainly expect that going back to Carthage would be the last thing on his agenda, but go back he did because he had given his word and a Roman is a man of honor and discipline above all else. Or at least that was meant to be the moral of the story. Having returned to Carthage, he was put in a barrel studded with spikes and rolled down a hill. After another decade of mainly indifferent success, the Romans finally defeated a Carthaginian fleet in the Agati Islands off the west coast of Sicily, and a treaty was signed which did then end the First Punic War. Rome was left in possession of, of Sicily, but Carthage was to be given a free hand to extend its ambitions in Spain. In 238, Hamilcar Barca, the father of Hannibal, arrived to lead the Carthaginian forces there and began to make the Romans nervous with his success. And when he died in 229, his famous son took his place, and the Romans told him to keep, keep the Carthaginian forces south of the Ebro River or be regarded as in violation of the treaty. Hannibal responded to this by assembling an army of 60,000 men and 37 elephants with which he crossed the river in 218 heading straight for Italy. <laughs> He is, of course, especially famous for crossing the Alps, but crossing the Pyrenees wasn't easy. Here you can see where the highway passes through the Col de Pertou near the Mediterranean south of Perpignan. Until 1976, this was still little more than a country road, although it has been a major route between France and Spain since antiquity. When Hannibal brought 60,000 men through, it couldn't have been much more than a narrow path, though, if that. The Romans were soon aware of what was going on, and the general Publius Cornelius Scipio was sent to head Hannibal off before he could cross the Rhone at Beaucaire, the 14th century castle of which you see on the far bank, the west bank in this picture, with the castle at Tarascon on the near bank in the foreground. Scipio, however, arrived here too late. According to Polybius, the campfires of the Carthaginians were still warm, but some think that Polybius emphasized how close Scipio, with whose family he was friendly, came to catching Hannibal here by way of supporting the general's case that he did his best. Some accused him of not making as much haste as he should have. The bottom line in any case is that Hannibal had already crossed a major barrier without having to strike a blow and was too far east for Scipio to try to catch him. apparently moved up the valley of the Durance River, seen here looking east toward the Alps. He had hoped to make allies of the Transalpine Gauls who also disliked the Romans, but not all of them believed the claim that he was just passing through, and despite some help from the Gauls, he was in constant danger of attacking this valley and beyond. Here's an aerial view of the route he may have taken across the Alps, following the course of the Gil River toward the summit of Monte Viso in the pass called the Col de la Traversette on the border between France and Italy. This seems like a likely route because the headwaters of the Po flow out of the glaciers on Monte Viso, and we know he came down the valley of the Po into Italy. It was mid to late September by the time he headed downhill on the Italian side, and there was a lot of snow, a phenomenon with which neither the Carthaginians nor their elephants were familiar. 
By the time they were out of the Alps, the attrition of his army caused by the weather and the Gauls had reduced his force to about half that which had crossed the Ebro, and he had lost most of the elephants. Some authorities believe he used some other pass, but I think it's odd that no elephant bones have ever been found in any pass. Dead elephants will leave a lot of bones. In Kenya, archaeologists find two million year old teeth just lying around on the ground. What happened to these bones is a mystery to me. When he realized Hannibal had gotten by him, Publius Cornelius Scipio sailed back around to make another attempt to hit him off as he came down out of the Alps. Somewhat west of the Ticino River, the armies finally met and Scipio was defeated. After reinforcements arrived under Sempronius Longus, another battle was fought in December at the Trebia, and this also resulted in a victory for the Carthaginians after Sempronius foolishly ordered his men to cross the freezing cold river to attack the Carthaginians instead of waiting for the latter to try to cross and attack the Romans. After this victory, all of the Cisalpine Gauls allied themselves with Hannibal. In the following spring, the Carthaginians headed south, and the Roman general Flaminius headed north to make another attempt to stop them, and the result of this was the Battle of Lake Trasimene. Hannibal drew the Carthaginian army up into the hills above the lake, where they were concealed by a dense fog, and when the Romans were marching by along the a lake shore, north to south, left to right in this picture. In pursuit of them, the Carthaginians suddenly attacked them from above. Flaminius himself was killed, and the army, the only large one, which had been between Hannibal and Rome, was destroyed as a fighting force. Many in Rome had written off Hannibal's earlier victories as flukes made possible by weird circumstances. But Hannibal was nevertheless now 3-0 and against armies that were considered the best in the Mediterranean. Hannibal was not prepared to mount a long siege of the capital itself, however. His strength lay in the maneuvering of his army in the open. He apparently hoped that Rome would agree to some treaty which would be to the advantage of Carthage, but the Romans refused all suggestions of peace, and he moved off then to the southeast. In Rome, Fabius Maximus, known as Cunctator, the delayer was now chosen dictator. In emergencies, the executive branch of the government could be turned over by the consuls to a single man with absolute power who was given this title. The approach of Fabius was to essentially wage a guerrilla war against Hannibal, harass the lines of communication, prevent him from getting supplies, and avoid a major battle until he just got fed up and went home. And this might have worked, but it was not popular. Many felt that this kind of robbing of delivery trucks and mailmen was unworthy of Romans, and that in what was called a fair fight, their army would still surely defeat the Carthaginians. As a result, two new consuls, Lucius Aemilius Paulus and Caius Terentius Vero, were elected in 216 to replace Cunctator, and they led a colossal Roman army of 80,000 men against Hannibal's army, which was about half that size at Cannae in Apulia. This is what the battlefield there looks like today. What was thought by the Romans to be a fair fight, a pitched battle on an open plain, was in fact greatly to the advantage of the Carthaginians, who relied much more on fast maneuvers and cavalry. And though heavily outnumbered in infantry, they had twice as many horsemen as the Romans. In one of the most famous uses of what's called classical envelopment, Hannibal allowed the Romans to push back his center while the wings of the Carthaginian army, led by the fast-moving cavalry, enveloped the Romans. The effect of this maneuver was to restrict the number of the enemy who can fight, the mass of the infantry just being jammed into the center and surrounded. In the end, the Romans lost something like 70,000 men, including the consul Paulus and 80 senators, while Hannibal apparently lost about 6,000. It was perhaps the greatest loss of life in any battle in history to that date. And to give you some perspective, that's approximately the number of people killed in the bombing of Hiroshima. Nuclear weapons aren't the only things that will kill people. Still, however, the Romans wouldn't discuss peace or anything else, even refusing to accept Hannibal's offer to return prisoners captured after the battle. Hannibal was winning all the battles, but seemed no closer to winning the war than ever.
And then finally, the Romans began to find men who could hold their own against Hannibal. This is a statue of Marcus Claudius Marcellus in the Capitoline Museum, and he was called the Sword of Rome even by Hannibal. The Carthaginians had taken Capua, about a hundred miles south of Rome, and it was often claimed that Hannibal succumbed too much to the pleasures of what was regarded as a decadent city. Capua was Hannibal's canny, is the way one historian has put it. There's no doubt he was losing confidence. After canny, the Romans did revert to the strategy of Fabius Cunctator and avoided pitched battles, attacking the Carthaginian forces only when they had a clear advantage. Until his death in a minor skirmish in 208, Marcellus was able to get the upper hand again and again over the Carthaginians, achieving his greatest triumph when he took a force to Sicily in 212 and captured Syracuse, although the battle is primarily remembered for the death of Archimedes, perhaps the greatest scientist of the ancient world who is said, on little evidence, to have used giant mirrors and lenses to focus the rays of the sun on the attacking Roman ships and soldiers to no avail. Had Marcellus lived longer, he might be the one remembered now as the savior of Rome from Hannibal. As it turned out, however, that honor went to Scipio Africanus, the son of Publius Cornelius Scipio, about whom we heard earlier. Carthage itself had sent little support to Hannibal, and a large army of reinforcements under the command of his brother was defeated by the Romans in 207. His brother's severed head was thrown by a daring Roman into Hannibal's own camp. Scipio felt that the way to finally defeat Hannibal was to attack Carthage itself and force him to return and defend his own homeland. But this was not a popular viewpoint. The Romans were doing better against him in Italy, and many felt that to take a large army to Africa would play into his hands, reducing the size of the force with which he would have to contend in Italy itself. It was also argued with good reason that Hannibal hadn't seen Carthage since he was a boy and hadn't, as I said, been given much help by his fellow Carthaginians in his single-minded attack on all things Roman. Might he not just say, I don't know Carthage anything, let it defend itself? Scipio's strategy proved right, though, and in 203, Hannibal returned to Africa with, however, only a part of his veteran army. The next year, 202 at Zama, where the modern village of El Kef is, about 75 miles southwest of Tunis, Scipio's army of 30,000 met Hannibal's much larger force, but most of those in the latter army were lukewarm mercenaries or untested infantry. The Romans won a great victory, which allowed Scipio to dictate peace terms. Carthage would be allowed to maintain its African territory, but was to be restricted to 10 warships and to pay a heavy tax to Rome for 50 years. Hannibal himself was, surprisingly, allowed to remain free, but that was in part because he had many enemies in Carthage who, somewhat ungratefully, blamed him for mismanaging the war against Rome and for bringing disaster on the homeland. In any case, within a few years he had managed to regain a following and strengthen the city to the point that Rome did demand his surrender, but he fled east where... After doing his best to aid Rome's enemies there, he eventually committed suicide. Some of Rome's neighbors, expecting that Hannibal would eventually conquer Rome, had given him considerable aid and comfort. Philip V, the king of Macedonia, was one such, and in 197, Titus Quinctius Flamininus, not to be confused with Flaminius, who lost the battle at Lake Trasimene, led an army into Greece to punish him, and the result was the Roman victory at the Battle of Kynoscephaly in eastern Greece. In this diorama, you can get a bit of an idea about what happened. The Macedonians were still using the phalanx with which Alexander the Great had conquered a large part of the world. It was a dense, almost impenetrable body of men wielding long spears, and pretty much as long as discipline prevailed, the phalanx was successful. The Romans under Flamininus, however, although they marched in legions of 5,000, could quickly break up into cohorts and still smaller centuries of a hundred men or less, which could outmaneuver the elephantine phalanxes. If the discipline of the phalanx failed, if men began swinging 20-foot spears any which way, all would be lost. And if they, they could get it close quarters, the sword-armed Romans had a big advantage. Post facto analysis of battles, the stock market, football games is easy, however. If Alexander the Great had been in charge at Gynoscephaly, the Macedonians probably would have won. 
The Roman army that fought at Canescefale was not organized in any essential way differently than it had been against Hannibal. Victory in war is in the stock market and football is often a matter of intangibles that don't show up in the statistics. This is a reproduction of the Roman short sword, the Gladius. After his defeat of Macedonia, Flamininus magnanimously withdrew his army to Italy, but when Antiochus III, the Seleucid king, proposed to fill up the power vacuum in Greece with himself, the Romans came back under Scipio Africanus and crossed into Asia for the first time, defeating Antiochus at Magnesia in 190. The final end to Greek independence came with the defeat of the so-called Achaean League and the virtual destruction of Corinth in 146. That same year, Carthage was also finally destroyed. When the period of the 50-year tribute imposed after the defeat of Hannibal at Zama ran out, the Carthaginians unwisely declared war on Numidia, which was a Roman ally, and this was followed by the siege of Carthage under the Roman general Scipio Aemilianus. Despite the fact that the city did virtually everything demanded to guarantee its future submission to the Roman will, the fury with which the Romans destroyed Carthage can, I suppose, be in part explained as a consequence of the fear they had themselves felt when Hannibal was threatening Rome, but even at a distance of 2,000 years, this is one of those episodes historians who admire the Romans find it difficult to talk about. The largest city in the Mediterranean, with a population of close to half a million people, vanished more completely than if a hydrogen bomb had been dropped on it. This is a model Roman soldier of the 2nd century BC. The average height of Roman soldiers is thought to have been about 5 feet 4, but they performed truly amazing feats of strength and endurance. They were expected to carry 80 pounds of gear and armor and to routinely cover 20 miles a day, often over very rugged terrain for weeks on end. And they did this on a diet of what would look to us like cream of wheat, or maybe Roman meal, as one company calls its bread. The Roman army conquered the world on gruel and only ate meat when there was nothing else. So much for the theory that vegetarians are nicer than other people. Until the mid-2nd century, the soldiers were conscripts, except in times of extreme danger, as during the war with Hannibal, when all able-bodied men would be called out. Surprisingly, except in that kind of emergency, only relatively middle-class men could serve. A property requirement meant that the poor were exempt. This is a bust now of Caius Marius, who extended Roman territory in Africa after the destruction of Carthage, and his adventures are the subject of the history of Sallust, which is in fact the earliest surviving history in Latin. Polybius, the historian of the war with Hannibal, wrote in Greek. In 105, the Romans suffered a terrible defeat at the hands of the Teutones and the Cimbri, two Germanic tribes which wiped out a Roman army of something like 100,000 men near Orazio, modern Orange in southeastern France. And Marius, who was for a time so popular he was chosen consul four years in a row despite the unconstitutionality of this, did away with the old property requirement for army service, establishing a paid standing army and enrolling anyone who wanted to serve regardless of class. This was looked upon as a great boon to the poor who were now given a chance to conquer and plunder in the manner of their social superiors. This new model army under Marius's command then destroyed the German tribes in their turn at the Battle of Mont Saint Victoire in Provence. A hundred thousand are said to have been killed or captured. This is the angle from which Paul Cezanne frequently painted this mountain, which is not especially high, 3,300 feet, but which stands out because of the flat country which stretches for miles around it. Here's a view of the mountain from the south where the battle took place. The village to the southeast is still known as Pourrières, the putrid place, allegedly from the atmosphere of the landscape after the slaughter. Ever since the battle, weird stories have been told about the area, often combined with Christian traditions in ways that would certainly amaze Marius himself. So Marius returned to Rome a hero, but there were many in the upper classes who resented his popularity with the lower classes. And to summarize a lot of complex political and social unrest in the early years of the first century BC, a civil war began between Marius and his more plebeian supporters on one side, and his former associate in the African campaigns, Lucius Cornelius Sulla, and the latter's more patrician supporters on the other. 
This is a portrait of Sulla in the Munich Glyptothek. Marius himself died during the war, which finally ended with the defeat of his son by Sulla in the Battle of the Colline Gate on the edge of Rome in 82 BC. With the support of his army, Sulla proclaimed himself dictator and set out to eliminate as many of Marius' former allies as he could catch. He himself was in poor health, however, and retired in 79 to a villa near Naples where he died the next year. One of those associates of Marius who escaped was the latter's nephew by marriage, the 20-year-old Julius Caesar, and after the break, we'll hear about him. Mm -hmm.